Okay, here's a question for, I guess you could say specifically for the Browning CB radio community. Um, I just want to get everybody's opinion. Um, I have a customer that sent me a Browning Mark IV, not a 4A, a Mark IV, which is anybody that's ever owned one that had problems with it probably knows they can be a, uh, how should we call them, bottomless pit <laughs> for uh, sucking your wallet dry. Um, they had one of the most... I don't want to say it was complicated, but one of the most unreliable, probably, uh, synthesizer PLL circuits known to man. <laughs> uh, Browning made some of the absolute best CB radios back in the tube days. They were one of the few gods of, you know, tube-type CB radio. Uh, they commanded a premium price back then. They still do today just for that same reason. They're really good radios. The Mark IV, however, was their attempt to, I guess, kind of stay in business in the 40-channel era and have and start to use some of modern technology. Um, matter of fact, let me just reach over here and grab a schematic uh, for it. So, they're, they're kind of oddball in that they have a normal VFO operated receiver but the transmitter on the other hand is an abomination <laughs> the tube type part works just great the synthesizer circuit on the other hand is an absolute nightmare it's comprised of over two dozen <laughs> IC chips so it's not like you're used to nowadays you know, basically one chip wonders. One PLL chip, a couple, you know, other components in the circuit, crystals and whatnot. But yeah, other than that, there's basically one IC. is your entire oscillator PLL circuit. I mean, it just it does everything. So I'm going to try and get what is... Uh, let me turn on another light here. I'm going to try and get just the PLL circuit in picture here. Basically, yeah, right about there, you're looking at, other than you know, don't pay attention to the tube filament, so you have, everything here is the PLL synthesizer circuit. And when they have problems, oh boy, can they be a pain in the butt to work on. Um, for starters, they're just a pain in the neck to work on, physically. The PLL can is... You know, it's a sealed little can. You got to work on that. You got to pull the kind of pull that up and out. The front two boards, the display board, and all that. Man, it's, they use you know solid tie point style wires. It's not not stranded wire. So you're trying to. It's just man, it's a pain in the neck. And if anybody's worked on them, they can be even worse. Well, anyhow, I've got a customer that sent me one. Uh, basically to have it restored, recap, the whole nine yards, and it won't transmit. And when you have PLL problems with those, it goes out a lock, and it will not transmit. And the channel display goes out, because it's, has, it's digital. So the receiver is old-type manual VFO. The transmitter has the digital display. Well, that's screwed up. Now, he had had it somewhere else. I won't say where. I don't like naming names. I don't, don't like bad-mouthing people. Um, but it, it was sent somewhere else to another shop, and it had a channel mod done to it. And, oh boy, was it ever modded. There are cut traces. There's parts just added all over the place in the PLL module. There's address lines. Like, look at the schematic. When I say address lines... So you've got that separate little aluminum PLL box. It has a bunch of what I call the address lines that run in between. All of this is inside that PLL box. And that runs out through, these are would actually be wires here. And they run up to that front display board that has an EEPROM on it. And the EEPROM sends out the programming, basically, is what that does. So it's sending, it's either a ground, or it's actually a zero or a one. So, you know, either low voltage, less than one volt, or a one, which is around somewhere between four to five volts. 
but that sends the voltages out to program the pins of the PLL. Well, they've even disconnected some of these address lines and then have them hooked up in other places in the module. So, like, A, uh, where is it, right here, A is no longer connected to the EEPROM. A now is hooked up to H down here, which would normally, yeah, it's, and there's, it's got a different EEPROM in it, and without any reference material, uh, it's one of those, I just looked in there and went, and then there was a chip missing. There was a, uh, actually, what the hell one was it? 74, it was 105, yeah, so it was a, a 74, 160, hell is it? 163. Yeah, 74, 163. That was even just missing off, off of uh, the one board. But, uh, yeah, it, or no, it wasn't that one. What the hell was it? Never mind. It was a 44, there it is. It was a 74, 145. That's right. It wasn't one of these. That's in the PLL module. It was on the small board behind the main display board. It was a 74, 145. So I put that in there. Well, when you turn it on, you do get a about a tenth of a second or less. It's barely even visible. You'll see both digits light up and it go right back out because it goes goes out of lock. It's got problems. But like, where in the hell do you start? This circuit has been so modified and hacked up, and the truth table now for the EEPROM is no longer any good because the address lines no longer go to wherever the hell they went, and I don't know how that's programmed. So, yeah, it's... So, what do you do? Try and find another transmitter with a good, basically the entire PLL synthesizer circuit so you can just put it back to factory because I'm here to tell you I could spend days trying to reverse engineer, or not reverse engineer, but just trying to find, you know, I'd have to completely remove all three of those boards out of the radio and basically go through part by part and see what was changed and put it back the way it's supposed to be. So... What do we have maybe for... Now, I'm usually against doing drastic modifications to a radio, but this may be one of those exceptions. Because um, it was a, a very poorly designed... I mean, it's so poorly designed. Name another CB radio that has a reset switch on the front of it. The PLL circuit was so unreliable and it would lock up that they had to add a reset on the front of the radio. So when it locked up... The owner could reset it. <laughs> so, now Nomad used to make a little, uh, it's a cute little thing, a little small board. It replaced all three of those big monster boards just using a you know, microprocessor, modern little board. Um, and that was great. But the only problem with that is he no longer makes them. <laughs> so... We're back to square one. What do you do if you want to try and update it to a little bit modern technology? So, I just happen to have a bunch of these laying around. I bought a bunch of these. Uh, these were specifically, uh, these were made by a ham. They were for ham radios. Basically, your old tube types, Kenwoods, I, the Yezus, you know, like the FT-101 series. These were designed specifically for that. So, um, you can see it's the... They were coded or programmed to have, you know, receive and transmit. You can program in your offsets, um, you know, so like for different modes for upper, lower sideband. Your reference offset, because the out output frequency of your synthesizer is always going to be different than the actual frequency you're transmitting and receiving on. So, you know, you can set this up, set the offset, so the display's reading one thing, and the actual frequency coming out is what the actual radio needs. But like I say, I have a bunch of these laying around. Now... The big downfall of this is the display size, because the hole where the two LED digits were in the browning is only about that wide. You know, you're looking at like maybe that much, just just a, a little window. So I would have to cut the hole out to enlarge it. Um, now I can do that without it looking hacked, because this was designed, as you can see, it has screw. You know, these were well made. Like I say, it's basically a ready to install. You can see what I have hooked up: positive, negative. I've got a coed. That's the output. It's actually a, a small connector there, and I've got it going through a, a 50 ohm termination right here. And then for right now, I actually have that going up to the spectrum analyzer up there. So that's actually what's coming out of the VFO right now.
a 707.11 millivolt signal. Um, but, you know, I hate modifying radios. Like I said, I'm, I'm old school. I like them old, but uh, you know, this might be one of those exceptions. The Mark IV, it was just, ugh. They're great radios when they work, but when they fail, oh, they can fail horribly and just, you know, and no matter how many, how well you repair that PLL v, or synthesizer circuit, it's just going to fail again. Um, so, what do you think about me installing something like this? I'd like to get a couple people's opinions. People that own Brownies, you know, am I, because to me, this is heresy to cut a to enlarge the hole in the front of the radio. But, you know, you're kind of stuck. I'm not an engineer. I don't build these things for a living. So it's not like I can redesign this to use a smaller little teeny tiny display. I know they make them, but, you know, I don't write code. So, yeah, I can, but I can make, I can probably make this work. It shouldn't be too hard, um, you know, to replace those three boards out of that radio you know, in the transmitter section and just stick in one of these. But like I say, I would have to enlarge the hole. Now, like I say, these were designed to be installed in a radio, so it already has the standoffs here. You can see there's, you know, it even, even provides the screws. Um, so you drill four, you know, cut your big rectangular hole, drill four holes for the mounting screws, you mount that in the radio. Now, these they're not supplied with it, but you can get them because this is a standard size window. You can get the little plastic snap-on uh, bezels that go around it so you know all the screw heads and everything would be completely covered so it would look professional when you got done it's not like it would be a big rough edged gouged crappy looking hole um, it would look neat but I just like I say to me I kind of cringe even thinking about it because it's cutting a hole in a radio and I don't like cutting holes in radios I don't like drilling holes even in the backs of radios um, you know but like I say, it's, ah, what, what do you do? You know, how much money do you, do you dump into that thing trying to get a PLL synthesizer circuit repaired only to then have it fail again and fail again and fail again and fail again because it's a Mark IV. That's, <laughs> like I say, they work great when they work great, but they're, yeah, it's, you're going to have problems. So leave some comments. Let me know. Uh, ideas. Has anybody done this before? Um, one of the first things I gotta pull, I actually have to pull one of my working ones off of the shelf. I need to check and see what the, uh, how much those radios need for drive. I've, uh, right off the top of my head, I can't remember what, what the output is coming out of the, the you know, on the BNC cable, the, that PLL module, what the, what the output level is. So, I'm not 100% sure I can get this one to work, but I think, see, Another advantage of this one, this was designed for use with solid-state or tube-type radios. So this has two output levels. It has a low output and a high output. And actually, uh, I have to pull up the spec sheet. Uh, what the hell was it? Uh, 500 millivolts in low power and 1300 millivolts in high power. Um, and the way you can control that is you, there's actually a jumper in there, and then you can also vary the input voltage because it only requires, what, uh, I've lost the page now. Yeah, 7 to 16 volts. So, you know, the more voltage you pump into this thing up to 16 volts, that will also increase the output of, of it. So, you know, what do you think? You know, am I crazy? Is it heresy what I'm think, thinking of doing? Because the customer is up for any options. Um, like I say, because I look at that thing, and man, trying trying to get that thing put back to the way it was before, man, that's, that's going to be days worth of work trying to undo that. And man, it's just, it's hacked. Just, I just looked in there and, oh, God, what, you know, what, it almost makes you want to cry. What did they do to this thing? You know, I just... I'm sorry I can't show it to you because I put it. I was so frustrated with that thing with all the, the shit that somebody did to that thing. I just put it back together and it's sitting on the shelf because it's, oh, how people can do shit like that to a radio. You know, at least if I do this, it's going to be neat. Actually, it's going to be really neat compared to what's in there because all of that's going to go away, and then the only thing that's going to be in there other than the two, you know, vacuum tube boards. 
you know, for the, the stuff that's going to stay. But uh, basically the entire synthesizer circuit goes away and it's replaced by this little module. Let me actually disconnect this so I can show you the entire thing. That pulled off. All my adapters off. So you can see it's triple stack board. So it's very small. Everything's you know built right in. There's all kinds of stuff you can do to this with this thing. Um, and basically, all you need to operate this um, is this rotary encoder that's included with it. So just a rotary encoder, and it's also a push button. So, what do you think? Would that be maybe one of the few exceptions to where <laughs> installing something like this would would be okay? Um, and like I say, if you have any experience installing one of these in a Browning, uh, I'd be interested to know what your what your experience was like. I know this one here is rich in harmonics. Oh yeah, actually, let me hook it back up and show that to you because it is it is a I guess you could call it a great noise generator oh, for Pete's sake my cables all wrapped up here ground and positive okay we go back up to the spectrum analyzer uh, let me just put the span at ah uh, hell I don't know 200 megahertz <laughs> yeah so here's our fundamental frequency peak you see that's our fundamental and then there's the second harmonic, the third harmonic. I'm not sure what the hell that is. <laughs> There's the actual fourth, fifth, sixth, and then it has it has some other spikes. You know, there's the first, second, third, fourth, fifth harmonic, and it even has some other spikes in here. But uh, you know, were these a problem? Um, again, what I really probably need to do is just pull one of my working ones down, hook the output of a a working one up to you know spectrum analyzer and see is that PLL circuit rich in harmonics so luckily let me know um, you know you think it's a good idea or a bad idea like I say I'm I'm inclined towards the bad idea but <laughs> by the same token I'm kinda it might be acceptable in this one instance because <laughs> uh, there, yeah. What else can you do for one of those four radios? So, let me know. I'd be interested to hear your comments.